Almanek Moskofian, Chairperson of Armenian National Committee of UK, and I'm also the Secretariat of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Armenia. We have with us uh, Baroness Cox, our beloved Baroness Cox, who is the uh, crossbench peer in the House of Lords, uh, who served as Deputy Speaker from 1985 to 2005. Baroness Cox is the founder of the Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust, HEART, and has been recognized internationally for her work in humanitarian and human rights arenas over the last 20 years, including Sudan, Syria, Nigeria, Burma, and of course, Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh. She set up also the rehabilitation center in Stepanakert, which I had the privilege to see last year. She's been vice chair of all the um, old party parliamentary group for Armenia for many years. She's an avid advocate for our cause. She's visited Artsakh during the war in the 90s and has since visited Artsakh, I think, 89 times. Is that correct, Baroness Cox? Well, I think it's 87. <laughs> but, but many of those were actually during the war itself in the early 90s. Yes. And we have our moderator, Lucina Manukian, Senior Policy and Strategy Advisor, Local Government Association, and she's also a committee member of ANC UK. Uh, you cannot see our tech support, our wonderful Mikhail Clayton, who is also a committee member of ANC UK. I will now pass to Lucina, who will be the moderator of this event. Please, Lucina. John. Thanks so much, Annette. Um, I know that we're going to start with, um, with a story from Baroness Cox. So I'll start off by sharing my screen and she can take us through this journey. And Lucine, will you, if I say next, can you move it on for me? Yes, that's absolutely fine. Wonderful. You're a genius. Here we go. Let's try and start. Start. Yes, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? I would just like to begin this time together with some pictures of the time that Reverend David Thomas, my colleague, who's also been in Armenian Art Tech many times, and I experienced last week in a very agonizing visit indeed. Um, and we want to share uh, the anguish, but also our enormous admiration and appreciation for the faith of your people in nagorno karabakh or Artsakh and in Armenia. So I've just got a few pictures because pictures speak louder than words and we'll stay with you uh, as we continue talking in discussion. But I think the pictures are very powerful. Next one, please, Lucille. We began our journey in. We began our journey into Artsakh by going to the wonderful, as many will know, thousand-year-old monastery at Dadivank. There we met Father Johannes, and it was a poignant time indeed because it was probably the day, but one. The next day would have been the last day that we could have visited Dadivank because it now goes into the area that is now controlled by Azerbaijan. Uh, Father Johannes was obviously deeply, deeply grieving. We witnessed probably the last wedding he would carry out there, that holy place. And here he is holding on to one of several 800-year-old hatch cars, uh, which are about to be removed and taken into uh, Armenia for safekeeping, because we all know what Azerbaijan does too, all too often with holy places and holy treasures. So this was the first place we visited in Daddy Bank. Next slide, please. And the people were praying there, and that's not a taken in Daddy Bank, but you will recognize that picture could be in any church that's taken in Gansasar on a previous visit. Mm -hmm. But I love the way the Armenians pray with the candles, and for me, it's a symbol of a light in a very dark part of the world at this time. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, 
and this is one of the very, very ancient stones. Um, you will recognize how ancient it is because of the kind of language. And Father Johannes is holding that because that's also being sent to a safe place um, in Armenia. And I would just like to pay huge tribute to Father Johannes. And he was at Gansas on the previous war. Um, he's now at Daddy Bank and he said he's going to stay there. He is not going to remove himself from there, whatever happens. So please do pray for him. And I may also say that he felt extremely abandoned by the international church. We asked him if he'd felt supported by the international church. And he said, no, he's had absolutely nothing. He feels entirely alone. So please do pray for a hero of the faith in Father Johannes. Next slide, please. We then visited Stepanakert, and there we saw some of the evidence of Azerbaijan attacking deliberately civilian targets. This is, was the maternity hospital, direct hit, as you can see, and absolutely, well, devastated. Next slide, please. And another picture of the maternity hospital, just again to show the extent of the destruction. And it is a war crime to attack a face such a hospital. So Azerbaijan has been allowed to get away with far too much with impunity, and I hope will be called to account for that. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. And this is the music school in Stepanakert. Uh, I think it's probably cluster bomb damage. But David has just reminded me that when the maternity hospital was hit, they were still working there, but they were working in the basements. So thank God they weren't injured, but on the other hand, working in basements. And we actually have a photograph somewhere else that was sent to us of a child being delivered in the basement of that hospital while it was being bombed. This is the music school in Stepanakert. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the just destruction of people's civilian homes. You'll see the remains of a burnt out car there, the remains of a home, and again, deliberate targeting of civilians. Next slide, please. And here we are at the electric power station. Uh, Azerbaijan targeted that, mm -hmm. so there would be no provision of electricity for the people. And so it was especially awful for people in basements and cellars and had no light or heat. And there's my colleague, Reverend David Thomas, sitting next to me now. And our wonderful hero, the Peace Baden Terevosian, who has developed the Cox, Lady Cox Rehabilitation Center in Stepanakert from a bombed out old building from the last war to what is internationally recognized as a center of excellence internationally. And I have to say that was not hit. And Vardan is going to go back, probably back there now, uh, trying to look after people in Artsakh who do need help with their disabilities and others they hope will return. Some of his specialist nursing team will remain in Armenia to look after people with disabilities there. And some will come back and try to restore care for people with disabilities in Artsakh itself. And he's a real hero of the piece. This is on the way back. And we saw so many of these heartbreaking pictures. Um, this was a home. And as people had to leave their homes because the land was going into Azeri control, they would take all they could. It took us about 12 hours driving from Stepanakert back to Yerevan because the road was completely jammed with people fleeing. And they had given such possessions that they could take, but those they could not take uh, then had to leave and they burnt their homes so their homes would not be left for as areas to inhabit. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the spirit of Armenia. Wonderful. You are amazing people, you Armenian people. These are refugees from Artsakh. They're being housed in church buildings in Armenia itself, but of course they've lost everything. They're living in complete destitution. One, well, a lot of the ladies wept with me and said, we, we just don't know where our husbands, our sons, our fathers are. We wait that sometimes if they did terrible things in Azerbaijan, sometimes if they captured someone, they would torture them, and maybe behead them or kill them. And they would record all that on the person's own phone and send that back on social media. And one of the ladies said to me, I just read to keep my phone in case it's got a picture of what's happened to my husband uh, if he's been captured by Azerbaijan. But in the middle of all this, here is a 12 year old boy beautifully playing the piano. So that's the spirit of Armenia, music even in the middle of the week. And uh, draw to a close, next one please. I want just to uh, pay great tribute to Archbishop Parkev Martirosian. Um, I was there in the last war. The Stepanakert, when 400 grad a day were coming down onto the city, and uh, it was hell on earth. And 
just by video, please pray for Archbishop Parker, he's Archbishop now, because he was in Stepanakert during this war in the new cathedral there, which so far has not been hit, but he's had a heart attack and he's now in Yerevan suffering from a heart attack, so please do pray for him. But I often quote him because I think he is an amazing man of God. And I'm sure he'd say the same in this war, he said in the last war. When I visited him, as you can see, his smoldering home is around him. He's a man whose life is literally saved by prayer. When the grads started coming in 400 a day, fired from Shufi by Azerbaijan, he would get up and it was war, I mean, winter, especially cold, there was no electricity, he'd get up in the dark and cold to pray. And this particular morning, he got up and the bombing started to pray and knelt by his bed. And about a minute later, a grad hit his home. You can see the ruins there. And there was a huge concrete slab on his bed. But his man, his life was literally saved by prayer. But I asked him for a message. And this is the message he gave me in the last war. But I'm sure he'd give the same message today. But it is an amazing message. In a state of shock, his home smoldering around him. I said, you have a message for the world message for the church and I will finish with this his message from last time next time please and this was spontaneous he just spoke it uh, in that terrible situation first of all he gave thanksgiving so we thank God that after 70 years of Soviet communism we are free to pray again in cellars and the field of battle defending the lives of those who are near and dear and then there's a challenge to everybody it's not only the perpetrators of evil who commit sin but those who stand by, seeing and knowing, but do not condemn it or try to avert it. And I'm afraid our British government comes somewhat within that category at the moment. But then his amazing message of love. We have a gospel of love. Whatever demonic forces are at work, not only in this war, but anywhere in the world, we must never hate. We must still love. We must always love. What an inspiration, what a privilege to be with your people in those dark and terrible days. Thank you for letting David and me share the pain and the passion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Baroness Cox. This uh, was really emotive, I think, for, for me and probably for many of the Armenians who are also listening on this call. Um, but, you know, you're you're the only British parliamentarian and probably one of the very few British people who um, you know, visited Artsakh during this time of crisis. So what prompted you to, to, to visit Armenia and to visit the, uh, the region of, uh, of, of Nagorno-Karabakh and Artsakh, even though you knew that it was under intense shelling at the time when you went and also in the midst of a, a global pandemic? What made you go? Well, I think the times of trouble are the times you need to be with people. You know, Anyone can go in a happy time for a holiday and nothing wrong with that. But when people are really suffering, it is a time to be alongside them and to let them know that they are loved and we do love them and admire them. And if we'd been able to go to Sushi, but by the time we got there, it was in his airy hands, David and I would have loved to have made a presentation there. And I would express my love and admiration for the Armenian people as I just have tried to do. I will again and again and again. But Father David, he served as a chaplain in the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines for 20 years. And he would have stood in Chushu and he would have worn his clerical collar to show his spiritual solidarity because the Anglican Church is in communion with the Armenian Orthodox Church. So he would have been there as fellow members of the same Christian communion. But David would also have worn his berry from the Marines to show his solidarity with and admiration for the valiant people find, fighting on the front lines. So that's what took us there. And that's why we wanted to go there. That's amazing. Um, and, and David, was this the first time you went to, to Artsakh? Was, you know, what was your experience like going there? Um, I think it was my 15th, one five, visit to Artsakh. Um, every time with Baroness Cox, and it was with her that I first went there. And I've always loved it. I've always felt so much. It's part of Europe. It's the same civilization, the same values. Um, I shared, you know, the democracy, the freedoms, etc. And um, I, I, I won't steal Caroline's thunder now, <laughs> but that um, one one of the main things on on this visit was people were traumatized. People, some felt bitter. Um, obviously, immense grief um, that they felt the way that the rest, you know, their soldiers were brave enough, had endured so much that they held out more than long enough for the world to intervene and the world chose 
not even to hear, let alone to intervene, you know, the, 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 um, their, their soldiers had that. And what came out, so there's this great sense of loneliness, but what came out, we already talking about the future and talking about hope. And it really did express how um, the Armenian people just, you know, you cannot keep the Armenian people down for all that they've suffered over the centuries. Yeah, indomitable. Mm. And so it, it seems like you've had the opportunity to maybe speak to some of the refugees, some of the survivors and residents. Um, what, what, what were the stories that they told you? And, um, you know, what do you think the future is for, for the region and for the population of, uh, of Artsakh? Well, the stories they told were heartbreaking. As I already indicated, one of the great tragedies is that they don't know if, if their loved ones have died. Well, it's tragedy, big, big tragedy but almost worse is if they're missing, because they know what the Azeris will do very often to prisoners. And we've got horrible stories of the way they perpetrate atrocities. As you may know, there are 4,000 Syrian jihadists who were transported to Azerbaijan by Turkey to fight in this war. And we were told that they get paid a, on average of $200 for every Armenian whom they behead. So there are stories, well, stories, but it's evidence of beheadings and for those whose loved ones are missing, they just don't know it. Their loved ones are being tortured, beheaded, what's happened. So they are in a state of absolute anguish. And we just we wept with them. There's not much more one can do is hug and weep and pray is what we did. But it was in that context that that young boy played the piano. And that I think is just such an amazing testimony to the spirit of Armenian people. But their, their stories were about those they've lost and their anguish of having lost loved ones, but also you asked about the future. They just don't know. They've had to leave everything. They had to leave well, anything they could bring out, they brought out, but everything else they had to leave behind. So they lost their loved ones, they've lost their livelihoods, uh, they've lost their homes, and they just don't really know what the future mm -hmm. holds for them. So again, they need a lot of prayer. It, it seems like there is still a lot to do. Um, and for those listening, um, you know, the, you know, talk about the anguish, but of course there's also the anguish for those who are kind of not on the front lines and willing to kind of go and help and do something. So as a human rights sort of advocate, um, what do you think, you know, Armenians and other people who are really willing to help Nagorno-Karabakh and help uh, people are tough, how can we turn these stories into advocacy? How can we um, make an impact from here, from where we are? Thank you. Well, I think there's two aspects. There's a both aid and advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, the aid is obviously desperately needed. Uh, we were able to take out some money for aid from heart, um, but people lost everything. And so they need help with just the basics of daily living of those who've had to flee to Armenia. Um, some have relatives and families to go to, but they're living very overcrowded without the, uh, the, the means for making a living at the moment. So they desperately need aid of all kinds clothes, food, medicine, help with accommodation. Um, but on the advocacy side, I hope everyone will put pressure on their particular political leaders, whatever country you're in, um, because the world has stood by. Um, everyone we spoke to felt that nobody, nobody had actually taken up their case. And you know, I can't see anybody's taken up their case effectively. People may talk, people may pass the odd sort of statement, but that's not going to help people who are being slaughtered, where there's genocide occurring. And so I would hope people will put huge pressure on their governments to recognize a genocide. Uh, the Genocide Watch, which is the official organization on genocide, has 10 categories. And Azerbaijan comes at the very top of that category. They've fulfilled every criterion for genocide that there is. And um, we shouldn't let that happen. After previous genocide, people have said never again, but it has happened again mm -hmm. and again. I mean, we must not let it happen again with Armenia and with Artsakh. So I think there's a lot of political pressure, a lot of pressure on churches. Um, Father Johannes hadn't had a single message from a church. I'm sure the church had some links with the Armenian Orthodox Church, probably in Yerevan, but people at the front line have hardly had anything. And so please aid and advocacy for people suffering so much. Do you want to David? Yeah, I'll just add that um... The need for aid obviously is great and a lot of um, infrastructure which the Armenian diaspora 
was paid for over the past 20 years has not only been destroyed, but it's also been lost in the areas um, that Azerbaijan um, um, and Turkey now occupy. So there will be much aid and rebuilding needed. I would love to be able to say, and Caroline would love to say, that we hope the British government, having stood by and done nothing to help them and during the war, that now it would see um, some obligation to um, help them with aid. Um, I think we're afraid that Azerbaijan won't allow the UK to help them uh, with aid. A terrible thing to say. But, of course, um, there are other countries in Europe who don't have the agenda, the, the Turkish agenda that um, the UK has. And we hope that other countries will look kindly upon the, the need for development there, and as well as security. Yeah. Um, since, since we've come on to the question of, of government and governments taking action, I've actually got a couple of questions from the audience, one from Richard Cousins, who's kind of asking, what, you know, the, asking you to address sort of the rather inadequate response from the UK government, and a question from Harach in the US as well, who's asking, what is the next step in terms of presenting this uh, to the parliament and bringing justice for the crimes committed, particularly the war crimes that have been committed? You know, what, um, what can be done? What, how can we put pressure on the government? Well, very important questions. Um, before I went, and the week before we went out to Armenia and Artsakh, I had a question in the House of Lords challenging the British government what it was doing, that the Genocide Watch had said this is called genocide, what is the British government doing? It didn't get a very satisfactory answer. What it says, of course, it's talking, it's making representations, it's discussing. Well, that doesn't help the person on the ground who's lost everything. Um, the widow doesn't know what's happened to her husband. That doesn't help people actually suffering in situ. So a big challenge to the British government. Um, I was pleased that there were quite a lot of people, it's only question time, you have a limited number of people, but almost all the questions that came in from other members of the House of Lords were very supportive of Artsakh and very critical of the British government. So we need to build up that criticism. But the problem is, I think, this is, this is me speculating, but I think it's well-based, is that we have too many interests. We have oil interests in Azerbaijan. And I remember when I went to a senior person in the Foreign Office during the last war in the early 90s, and I had pictures of, which I'd taken myself, of children in Stepanakert shredded by cluster bombs. And I said, will the British government make representations to the government of Azerbaijan to stop using cluster bombs on civilians? It's against international law. The answer, no country has an interest in other countries, only interests. We have oil interests in Azerbaijan, good morning. Well, I was so angry, mortified, sad. I actually quoted that on the floor of the House of Lords and said, I'm ashamed to be British. I'm not naive, I can understand security interest, I can understand commercial interest. I don't think it's long-term interest of any nation that there's obliterate concern for human rights. And I don't think the majority of British people would want oil at the price of cluster bombs on children, at least without saying something about it. So the British government, I think, has been very, very delinquent in what it has allowed. It, looked, it almost looks like complicity, and we'll be challenging British government, and so will my colleagues who share these passions on that issue. And you had two questions. That was the first one. So what was the second? Yeah, the, the, the second one, I mean, the, the first one was about you know, the government. The second one was also about, you know, what uh, steps do we need to take to present this further to Parliament and bring justice for the war crimes committed? Because clearly that's something that is well documented. We know what happened. We have plenty of examples and we have evidence of, of war crimes being committed. So what is the next step for... Um, you know, for you as an advocate, but also for other um, people in the community or concerned who want to take action? Well, I think we need to do all we can <laughs> to ensure that those who commit war crimes get called to account. They do not get away with impunity. Um, and so there will be various avenues. I've got to explore that. I only got back a few days ago. <laughs> We're working now on all the follow-ups. But um, that will be certainly something which I would be very, very concerned that people do not get away with war crimes with impunity. It's happened, I'm afraid, in too many places, in too many times, but I think, and I hope everyone who is sharing this conversation and sharing the passion will do all we can to make sure that our governments and relevant organisations take up the war crimes that have been committed and make sure that people are called to account. Mm. I've got a few messages from, from the audience where they're, they're quite concerned about the fact that, you know, for the last two months we have been, you know, crying and calling and screaming at the top of our voices, asking the world 
to listen. So, you know, why is it that um, you think, in, in your view, that the world sort of touched and did nothing um, on this on this issue? What what is it that stopped the world from taking action? Very, very good question, and I wish I knew the answer to it. I mean, I'm as shocked as everybody else is. Um, as I say, I think it's probably interests of various kinds. There are a lot of interests in Turkey as well, and people don't want to upset Turkey. Um, they all interests and other interests in Azerbaijan. I have a nasty feeling that it is interest, because I can find no other reason for it. I mean, I think it is absolutely abominable that people knew that people were suffering genocidal attacks and let it all happen. So I ask the same question of anyone who's taking part in this meeting would like to give me some suggestions. I'd love to hear from you because we were doing all we can in the British government. We're probably working with colleagues in the European Union. Um, if there are people watching from the States, I hope they'll put a lot of pressure on the US administration, which equally has done nothing despite an enormous and very well-respected uh, diaspora in the US. So I think we need to work together on this and would love to share with anyone who wants to share um, what we can do together. And I'm happy to make a report available uh, when it's done, it should be done by Monday. If anyone wants a copy of our report, would have a lot more information and detail in it. Happy to make that available. Great, and um, if, uh, that, that's really, really useful. And if people want to access reports, uh, just sign up to the ANC newsletter and we'll make sure that we share that via the newsletter. Um, you mentioned the US and the action that the US could take. I've actually got a question here from Brad Brayfield, in, who is based in the USA. He's asking, um, you know, what can you say about the health and disease of the migrants and of the health infrastructure in Atta? Because they're conducting some research on disease and health of migrants um, for both the past and current Atta conflicts. And we'd just like to understand what the health situation is like for the many people fleeing the country. What the health situation is like yeah. Oh, yeah. now or previously? <laughs> Uh, both, well, I think it's both now and previously, but now. Previously, I mean, obviously it's a post-Soviet country, so for a while it really suffered being post-Soviet country. But one of the things I admire so much about Artsakh is it's done so much to bring itself up to date, both in terms of democracy and human rights, and it's a very, very well-governed uh, country, extremely well. And health, they put a lot of work into health. Um, they had a new hospital, and the hospital you saw had been attacked. Um, and one of the things that has been our privilege to do from heart is help for people with disabilities because the Soviet Union had no care for people with disabilities at all. And uh, I did work in Russia with orphans and um, you were just stigmatized. You didn't go out because you upset people. And I do admire in every respect the people of Artsakh. One of the things I admire is after the war when they needed every kind of help they could get. Last one I'm talking about. Um, and everyone had been obliterated and so on, and they needed food, reconstruction, as David has already mentioned, etc. Um, we asked them, in heart, we always believe in giving our partners the dignity of choice. What's your priority for help in aid now? And they said, help for people with disabilities. And so that's been our privilege to try to help with people, well, with Vardan, who is the hero of the peace, who's changed a Bondado building into internationally recognized center of excellence for people with disabilities, whether it's children with autism, spinal bifida, cerebral palsy, road traffic accidents, or now it'll be the injured, or elderly people with strokes. He has a, he, a thousand patients a year and a lot of outpatients. And so that's one thing, but it's typical of the general <laughs> development in Artsakh of the quality of care for people. From the Soviet system to now, it has done amazing things. Mm. And if I could just add that um, um, if, if people do make and keep contact with people in the Nagorno Karabakh um, to uh, understand what are their particular needs. And the, way, the reason I would emphasize that, um, I, I think clean water and things like that are being restored. Um, but there is a case now that coronavirus is on the up um, in um, Nagorno Karabakh. And of course, one of the things which has made this so much a crime against humanity um, is legally um, categorized as such is the fact that this assault was launched during um, a pandemic and civilians are obviously under threat um, um, from the pandemic. So please do find out from there what is most needed and certainly um, it is going to need more help with a growing coronavirus problem, which was not there before. 
<coughs> Very helpful, thank you. Uh, just say keep your questions coming both on Facebook and um, on the chat because we're monitoring them and picking them up. Uh, so thanks for those. Here's an, an interesting um, question from uh, Mariam uh, Nazarian. She's asking, could you could you address um, and kind of discuss the involvement of Turkey in this conflict? Obviously, the British government denies denies any involvement, um, despite kind of quite a lot of open sources suggesting that there is evidence uh, to the contrary, and we know about the mercenaries being present as well. Um, what what was your experience on the ground? Well, on the ground, I think one of the worst things that Turkey did was to uh, import or to recruit and then to transport to Azerbaijan. It was at least 4,000 jihadists from Syria and they obviously were armed forces, but they also contribute to the war of terror because they do the beheadings. And so that was one of Turkey's, I'd say, contributions, use that word, very negatively, uh, to Azerbaijan's war. I think it also uh, provided a lot of uh, very advanced um, military resources, extremely advanced, and, the, and lots of the drones, the drones which either identify where people are and then maybe do the suicide drones which dive right in accurately on the targets that they've identified. So the provision of a lot of, well, Azerbaijan bought a lot of drones as well, including from Israel, it's an issue we've raised with Israel, our uh, sadness that Israel sold them so many drones, which have been such a lethal weapon. So I think <clears throat> resources, and I think there's a lot perhaps behind the scenes of things that Turkey has done in providing resources of all kinds. And I think some of that needs to be uh, looked at and taken account of. But that's what we heard on the ground. But there were such things happening. Yeah. Yep. And of course, the United Nations Office of Human Rights has condemned the Turkish. So my, my, so my colleague, Dick, why don't you speak to people? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, no I, I'm just saying we've also heard from analysts back here confirming um, the things that Baroness Cox um, has been talking about. And also, um, as I understand it, I've certainly seen it. Um, the document that the office, uh, the UN Office of, for Human Rights, condemned the deployment of jihadist uh, mercenaries and um, specifically mentioned Turkey, um, that they were condemned for it. So these things are very much there, and Turkey, in its whole supply of weapons, of course, is guilty of encouraging, um, of encouraging a war rather than a peaceful resolution. So many countries throughout the world are signed up to encourage a peaceful resolution. Of course, if you're supplying these kind of arms and you're making it clear to Turkey, to Azerbaijan, um, that you are not going to interfere, you're not going to intervene, don't bother about us, um, then you, you are colluding with it. You are showing that you have no genuine commitment to a peaceful resolution. And there are many governments in the country without naming them. There are many governments in the world who are guilty of that. Agreed. Apologies there. Uh, my computer decided to shut itself down. So I'm back with you. Um, so we've we've got another question from uh, from Mariam, which is, can, can you speak directly with the um, incoming Biden administration in the USA about this? But also, what is your view on what can be done in the USA? Well, certainly, I think I, I don't come from USA, but what I've learned when I've been on the ground in Armenia and Artsakh is that they're about as bad as the UK from the point of view of failure to intervene, failure to support, failure to call people to account. I don't know, of course, what the new administration will be like. Um, I'd love to work with American colleagues who are part of this or any way appropriate to try to encourage the new administration uh, to have a better record than the present one as far as Armenia and Artsakh are concerned. Um, they ought to, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we watch this space, but we'll do all we can with um, you know, any kind of advocacy, any kind of pressure, any kind of leverage, because the US ought to appreciate um, the, the, the cultural heritage, the spiritual heritage of Armenia and Artsakh, and they are at the moment in Artsakh at risk, as we know, of uh, very real danger of being obliterated, and there's also real fear amongst Armenians within Artsakh and in Armenia 
that this is a first stage or maybe a much larger onslaught onto Armenia itself. Mm. And uh, you may remember that um, President Aliyev, from I mean, some time ago now, said that in Baku, they've got sufficient weapons to take out the nuclear power station uh, in Armenia uh, with great threats. You know, that now is the time we can really get rid of Armenians as well. So it's a grim scenario, and I think we need to put all the leverage we can on anyone who cares about democracy, about freedom, about our cultural and spiritual heritage to intervene and stop this going on uh, unopposed. Mm. That makes sense. Yes, that's a, a very worrying assessment of the of the situation. Um, and we know, you know, obviously Armenia ended up giving up quite a lot of the territory and people are asking what your thoughts are on the recognition of the remaining part of Artsakh. Is that a step that will or can help resolve the situation in some way? I think it's one of the strongest things that needs to be done, most effective things. I've been arguing it in Parliament. Um, I believe passionately, and so do many colleagues, that Artsakh has the right to self-determination. <laughs> you know, we work in Hart and other countries and we work in East Timor, Timor-Leste as it's now called, that was granted the right to self-determination because of the way Indonesia oppressed its peoples. Eritrea was given the right to self-determination because of its treatment from Ethiopia. Kosovo got the right to self-determination because of what it had suffered. And if any country deserves self-determination, particularly after this war, with the atrocities and the appalling brutality that's been inflicted on the Armenian people, uh, the people of Artsakh deserve the right to self-determination. And because they have the right to self-determination, they then have the right to international recognition. And then they'd be in a far stronger position to require or request help from other nations. So I think self-determination is probably uh, the most important political move forward. That can, and that's the thing I would argue for leverage and it absolutely deserves the right to self-determination. And, and if we can emphasize that you know, so many people in the media are guilty as well as the government of talking about um, general assembly resolutions and security council resolutions from the, the UN. And of course, they cannot um, prevail over the UN Charter and the UN uh, and the, the UN's declarations and um, conventions on self-determination, genocide, etc. So that the right for the, um, of the right of self-determination for the people in the karabakh is absolutely clear under international mm -hmm. law and we shouldn't allow governments and others um, to get away with that claim and then if it can be um, recognized it does allow for more aid and more help in its development mm -hmm. and to come through which both it and, and armenia um, will need Thank you. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer. So we have a question from a European um, viewer, Lukasz Dembski, asking, you know, um, obviously they've got strong convic conviction that European governments, you know, have remained silent and passive over, over this issue. So, um, you know, and as a result, what we've seen today is that Russia has taken the initiative. Um, in the conflict. So what can the UN or the EU NATO countries do uh, to overcome this fear of spoiling relations with Russia and Turkey in order to act um, in the interest of peace? Well, I think there is a situation where fundamental principles have to override short-term politics. I mean, all politics are relatively short-term. And the principles of recognition of genocide, the right to self-determination, um, ending impunity, the terrible things that have been done and are on the record and are proven by Azerbaijan of breaking the law, breaking international law, using smirch, using cluster bombs, which are against international law. There is so much there that needs to be addressed and cannot be allowed to get away with impunity, as well as some horrible evidence, which I think there'll be more coming of that, of the torture of people, prisoners, uh, both predominantly military prisoners of war, of course, but also some civilians. I mean, there is film footage, there is evidence of these things. So I think the ending of impunity and the imposition of justice are the priorities which really need to be addressed as a matter of urgency. And, and does that mean then taking something to the European Court of Human Rights? What is the action that we need to take next in your view? 
Good question. I'd love to hear from everyone listening because we've only just got back <laughs> and you say we're, we are really busy writing our, our report and then working on the political initiatives with the evidence we now have, uh, which initiatives we should take. And there are so many that we should take. And we have an all party parliamentary group for Armenia um, in the British Parliament. And we'll be seeking advice there and deciding what are the most important initiatives and the most effective initiatives we can take. Um, so I know that someone has written to one of the UN bodies and the letter has been sent back to them and said this isn't the right body to write to, you need to write to this one. But I promise you that as soon as we've got our report written, we're thinking of putting the report into action. And we'd love to hear from anyone who's listening, um, you know, what advice or good ideas you may have. Because at the moment, we, I must admit, are pretty emotionally, shall I say, uh, devastated by what we saw. We've probably got pretty traumatic stress, but we're working like anything uh, to get things together in a coherent way. Mm. And um, the report, I hope, will be coherent and we will be, I know it will be, it's good already. <laughs> but uh, we'd love to share, share the initiatives because it's a huge issue and there's so many different facets to it. There's the impunity, there's the breaking of international law, there is the suffering um, of the people who, uh, and the really worrying thing, one of them, is the suffering of prisoners of war and civilians have been taken. Because after the last war in the 1990s, we heard stories of the most horrendous treatment of prisoners taken by Azerbaijan. So we need to get some form of access to them and some form of, I don't know, rescue for them and or protection for them. So there's a multitude of things that need to be done as a matter of urgency. So mm -hmm. we'd love to share uh, any ideas that anyone has because we'll be working on it nonstop. And you are right to emphasise the European dimension because yeah. Yeah. I think we in the UK have got to look to Europe. There's no, there's, we'll try with the UK government, but there's not much point and hopefully we'll be surprised. Um, but we need to look to the European government as well as to the governments of North America and other places like Australia, um, etc. Just very briefly, I think Canada uh, has done well. It did immediately stop selling arms to Azerbaijan yeah. as soon as this happened. And I think it did one other big political initiative. So we'll be yeah. looking for friends in the international community uh, to work together to try and help your people. Yeah. And there are sympathetic governments in Europe mm -hmm. and it's worth it. And although they were not able to do much, the point is that now they may be in more of a position to do so. And I think we need to encourage them. And we're all realistic. You know, Russia and Turkey are the two big players in that area and as one Armenian analyst said you know nothing can happen in this region without going through Russia and Turkey mm. you know it's a simple fact but that doesn't mean that the EU cannot um, um, have some say there and be involved both on the human rights and on the aid situation and as Caroline keeps on saying ending the impunity of the crimes that are being carried out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Question from Lucine uh, Yavjan: does, does the UK have any intention to consider sanctions against Turkey and Azerbaijan following the Dutch Parliament example, which we know is another uh, international government that's recognised what's happening and has imposed sanctions? Well, I wish, I hope, and I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is important. Yeah, yeah. In, in short here, uh, I don't think they have any plans to do so. Uh, unfortunately, despite all the letters and all the uh, briefings that the ATTG members uh, made to the, sorry, I don't know why it's uh, echoing. APPG members did to uh, the uh, when the law, uh, the parliamentary and the uh, minister. Who was uh, Wendy Morton, who was who's responsible for that part of the world? We did make uh, make uh, representations. We made uh, we we sent letters. We sent letters from the officers of the APPG. We sent all types of um, uh, evidence of uh, humanitarian catastrophe that is happening. Uh, evidence of crime wars evidence of mercenaries present, evidence of uh, phosphorus uh, chemicals that were used, um, evidence of Turkey being, because at the beginning, Turkey was denying that they were part of this uh, war. Um, 
Unfortunately, uh, we, they have not been convinced because of their relations, very close relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey. And this, we should not um, kid ourselves. This is the situation and we need to make more noise, uh, but it, the noise needs to be very strategized and it needs to be done in a very coordinated manner. That's very important as a community. So we are unified and you are, we are presenting our case uh, diligently. The other issue is also the fact that uh, despite all of this evidence that was sent, uh, the uh, foreign officer, unfortunately, do, do not think that the evidence produced was enough and they're still calling it allegations. That is the problem and that is what has, uh, um, has made this gag rule toward, uh, throughout the parliament and also in the media. And uh, I mean, the good example of that is the BBC, how they have uh, uh, so badly uh, behaved during this war. So these are, these are the problems. We have a reality. Uh, we will fight stronger, but um, People like our Baroness Cox are effective, but unfortunately only in uh, the House of Lords. And most of the decisions, most of the debates are being carried out in House of Commons. So we, that's where we need to really push and to the uh, decision makers. Uh, and we need to restart uh, strategize because the last uh, letter that we received was not very promising from the foreign office. I don't think uh, Baroness Cox has seen it, but I will be forwarding it to the APPG shortly. And it was very, very disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Annette. Um, just to return to some, a question from uh, from the audience, um, asking us what what we as kind of regular citizens, how do we get our voices heard? What is the best way to get through to our parliamentarians, to politicians, and to make sure something happens? Thank you. Well, if one looks at the way in which projects operate, <laughs> there are two levels where we need to be effective. One is obviously the high level and getting in touch with your MPs, getting in touch with the Foreign Office. And letters to MPs and Foreign Office may not sound very effective, but if they get enough, enough, they have to take interest in them. If they get one or two, they can put them in the bin. But if they get a lot, then they have to take it into account. So I do that, but also at the grassroots level. I mean, I think we've got to get this message out loud and clear. So if one could send around maybe some, um, that sort of thing where you get everyone to sign um, and you can get a, you know, a large number of signatures, we can take that to Downing Street, we can take that to Parliament. With the British government, it may not get us very far, but at least it's pressure and you never know, it might just strike a right chord with somebody, but if you don't do any, nothing will happen. And in other countries, it, you'd say the same thing. You've got to work with the people at the top, you've also got to mobilise the grassroots and get them to make a movement, which the people at the top have to take account of. Uh, just to interrupt again, I mean, we have set uh, uh, campaigns, online campaigns that many, many numbers of our community members did write to their MPs and most of the MPs uh, raised the issue with the foreign secretary. But unfortunately, despite all of that noise, the foreign secretary's response was very neutral and very uh, safe actually, so that they don't upset. This is the problem. They don't want to upset Turkey. And that's, that's, the, that's the issue. No matter how many letters we send, uh, although, I mean, this uh, campaign has been, the three campaigns we ran against Iran was very, very efficient. But uh, I mean, it's gone to the level of MPs. 300 MPs were contacted during this, uh, uh, the last campaign. And uh, then they, in turn, they were worried. They in turn uh, sent their uh, uh, letters to the foreign office, but unfortunately nothing, they couldn't uh, um, influence the decision makers internal. And so that's the problem right now where we are. But, I just, to, up here. but just to emphasize a point that um, 
Caroline um, is saying, that, and, and Annette is, is perfectly right there, but do remember that when you're writing um, to MPs, probably the important thing is not how many MPs you write to, but how many letters each individual MP receives. Yes. And, and you may well, and I'm sure you already know that, um, Annette and, and others, but that is the point that Caroline always uh, does emphasize. And um, when, when dealing with the UK government, well, unfortunately, we, we can no longer send letters to, a, to EU parliamentarians. Parliamentarians, um, we, um, we are ceasing to be a member of the EU, and there's far greater hopes that e the EU will, might become active in this area, far greater hopes than with the UK government. Um, but obviously, we, we're UK citizens, we have to do our best here. And um, we, we do have to keep on putting on pressure. And as you say, Annette, um, the strategy is needed, and we all need to be emphasizing the same points. Whatever points are going, whether it's war crimes, whether it's aid, whether it's um, um, self-determination, it's got to be decided what are the one or two we're going to concentrate on. And everybody concentrates on, on those. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. And that's a reminder for me to tell everyone that we will be launching a new campaign that will allow you to write directly to your MP uh, with a letter next week. So look out for that. And uh, follow us on both Instagram, um, Twitter, as well as on Facebook uh, for updates. And you can also sign up to our newsletter. I'm quite conscious of time. So I'm just going to take a couple more questions uh, from the audience and then we will probably have to conclude. Um, so I've got one question, which is, I think is a really interesting question uh, from uh, Tatevik. And is, that is, what is your view on the information war that is going on um, on both sides? Um, uh, bo sorry, both news, uh, news media, as well as on social media. Um, and, you know, what uh, we've obviously heard a lot of examples of um, also kind of hate uh, crime on social media taking place and, you know, what can be done? Um, what is our role? Well, may I say that one of the things that really worry us and have done for quite a few years is a deliberate teaching of hate crime in Azerbaijan, even in school textbooks. They brought up and the passion against Armenians mm -hmm. and the things they call Armenians, I'm, I wouldn't like to repeat now. But there is this very clear and clever policy of hate speech and hatred in Azerbaijan, which is very, very tactical and very effective in war because they, they kill an Armenian, they say they're killing a pig. And it's a serious issue, the hate crime. And that's very one genuinely a worrying thing. Um, what was the other part of your question? Um, I suppose, what can we, what is our role in that? You know, what well, can I we think do to stop it? One thing I, I would love Armenia, I think the Armenian government, I've said this for years and years and years since I first started going there, is to up the um, advocacy side on the international arena on the truth. It doesn't cost, I mean, Azerbaijan has mega, mega bucks to spread its propaganda, but it doesn't cost mega, mega bucks to get uh, news out into the international community, news of the truth, news of the reality of the situation and what Armenia would like to have done. So I would hope the Armenian government might mobilize uh, you know, the most intelligent people in the world who <laughs> have got the IT skills, which a little bit like you know, Hong Kong and Singapore in the Far East. You know, you've got the best IT skills in the Western world, I think. It wouldn't be too difficult to get a media campaign going with a lot of information here about the truth. And what is really important is to, to scupper the, the, as it were, the credibility of Azerbaijan's propaganda. You know, as I, and I did write one thing when I had a letter from the Zeri ambassador, but it's important to put things in context to show why Shushi hasn't been an Azeri city forever and ever. It used to be a center of Armenian culture, as you know, until Ottoman Turkey killed 20,000 Armenians to stop the archbishop's head on a pole. The truth has got to go out there to counter the Azeri lies. And I would hope that everyone can do that individually on social media, through your own networks, uh, to counter the Azeri lies and tell the truth that is so important. Because at the moment, the public don't know what the truth is. If they hear that, they don't do anything different, then they'll know nothing else to believe. So I think there needs to be an anti-Azeri propaganda agenda through social media, through newspapers, if you can get them, through media, but to get the truth out. And I must say, I have challenged Armenian president, after Armenian president, they need to do this. And I think uh, it's long overdue. It doesn't cost a lot to use social media, to use a modern technology, um, but you've got to get the truth out to counter the Azeri propaganda. And then people will understand more and you'll probably build up more support 
uh, with it to challenge the British government if people know the truth. Thank you. And um, I've got one final question, which has actually come through from a couple of different people, including somebody from, um, I think, Azerbaijan proper, which is um, about the future and whether there is a peaceful future for, for the region. And particularly, kind of, how do you see um, this, the future of the region as a whole? You know, is it a good development that, um, you know, all of the three countries, you know, Azerbaijan, Armenia, obviously Nagorno-Karabakh itself, um, have, you know, almost become host hostages of Russia? And wouldn't it be better for Western states uh, to help resolve this conflict? Uh, but really, the most important question is, is there a peaceful future for Atta? Well, I passionately believe that there should be, and there could be. If once it got recognized with self-determination to which it is justified, there's going to be a big political battle there. But if you get self-determination, of course there's a positive future, because it will be an independent nation, it'll have the right to independent right to international rights, it'll have the right to international support, and it would mean that it could become what it wants to be. So self-determination, I think, is absolutely priority. But alongside that would be the recognition of genocide, of what is going on, because the recognition of genocide would underpin the right to self-determination. And if it had self-determination, I think there could be a hopeful future. <coughs> that makes sense. Thank you. David, do you have anything else to add? Um, not to that particular point, but if I just say a final thing and then you can... I'll stay totally out the way for um, um, Baroness Cox to, uh, to talk. And I know we can all feel despair in, in, in this situation, but for those of us in the UK, we've, we've been here exactly before. Before the Second World War, while various European countries wanted to oppose Nazism, the UK government took a very neutral attitude to Nazism and didn't want to be its enemy. And Britain then stood aside when the Nazis walked into the Czech Republic, exactly as they've stood mm -hmm. aside in this instance. Those are the closest parallels, but things did change. And so it's a despairing situation as it was back in 1938, as the Nazis became more and more powerful. And Britain, there's always the, um, we've got to hope that there is a chance that Britain will wake up to what forces out in the Near East and the Caucasus that they are encouraging. And um, I would certainly emphasize that oil, yes, is a big problem. But the point is, one has always balanced commercial interests with values. The problem now is not that there are more commercial interests, but that Her Majesty's government and parliament has less and less of values in it. And the and I think Her Majesty's government and the Foreign Office, I got far less hold on values than the British public. I think the British mm -hmm. public, as Caroline said much <clears throat> earlier on, uh, would be horrified if they need a full story of how utterly without values the British government behaves. Mm -hmm. So we've been in this situation before and things did improve. We hope so. <laughs> thank you for that glimmer of hope uh, there at the end and thank you for your reflections. I will allow Annette to, to conclude today, but, but just from me, thank you so much for, for your honest responses and for sharing um, your stories and your experience and your impressions from us. Well, thank you, Lucine, for helping to make it possible. And um, we'll keep in touch. And please, anyone who's listened to this would love to hear and keep in touch with them. And so thank you for letting us share, as I would say, the pain and the passion. Thank you, Lucine. Thank you, Baroness Cox, you're an inspiration for us all. Thank you for sharing your experience. And uh, thank you, Lucina, for being such a wonderful moderator. Um, I'd like to also thank everyone for joining in our live uh, streaming of this event. Uh, we live uh, in one of the darkest days of uh, modern Armenian history. We need to transfer our sorrow and anger into advocacy and helping our nation. Diaspora is a big asset that needs to be tapped and we hope we can save our nation from this catastrophe. Thank you all for coming. Please follow us on our Instagram, Facebook and on uh, Twitter. 
And we, uh, we, as you know, we are, uh, uh, we've started doing our newsletter. We will uh, keep you updated by email as well through our newsletter. Thank you all. Thank you very much, David, as well. It was a pleasure to meet you as well. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Thank God you. Bye. God bless. Bye.